So, so in 1995, you began a consulting relationship with Robert Friedland, and this soon evolved into a permanent position as exploration manager with a new uh, Friedland company, Indochina Goldfields Limited, and they had you relocated to Indonesia. And did this company then become Ivanhoe? Um, I'll go back a bit, James. I, after I left Amex, um, and the reason I left Amex was, as I mentioned, the demise caused by the trying to call in the world money market. So expiration budgets dried up, of course, which is the first thing that happens when a company's struggling financially. And so um, I decided together with actually a number of us um, that it was time for a change. And so there was three of us, uh, Michael Spadafora, myself and Graham Brown. And Graham actually, had, we'd done our MSCs at James Cook together and we were all working for Amax at the time. So each one of us decided to um, let's give a uh, try going on our own and see how that goes. Um, I formed a, a very small consulting business. Graham, I think, went contracting for Kennicott at the time, uh, I think on Lee here. And Michael um, was working for CSR, I believe, in Indonesia. However, he and I kept a loose association and we'd occasionally work together on various jobs. But um, to get back to, um, to Robert Friedland, um, as part of my um, consulting business, I, I'd been in it for about 10 years, everything was going fine. And together with uh, two surveyor friends of mine, we decided to um, set up a branch in Ventian, in Laos. Uh, my friends had succeeded in... Quick question, how was your French? Oh, high school French. But it, it's actually, like all those places, uh, it was only the old people who who even spoke French uh, okay. because of the colonial um, so it's like Vietnam. situation. Vietnam, <clears throat> Cambodia, Laos. Um, most of them actually didn't prefer not to speak French, uh, especially after the uh, Indochina War. Okay, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, Karen. No, no problem at all. But I can read it, but that's as far as it goes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, my friends were successful in getting the contract from the Australian government to do all the survey work for the Mekong River Bridge. So that was quite a, a contract to get. And my role was to, to be involved with anything geological that came up. I hadn't been there very long and um, Robert Friedland, Ed Flood and his lawyer arrived in Ventian and they were looking at trying to set up um, an exploration company in the region and it was called Indochina Goldfields. Uh, Indochina of course reflecting the geographic locations of Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. Anyway, somehow Robert had um, found out I was there. Um, he must have knew a little bit about what I do. So uh, uh, I received a message, um, could we set up a meeting? So I said fine and uh, we did that. Um, Robert and Ed explained their aspirations to set up uh, a company for uh, opportunities in those three countries. And uh, at the time I said, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably busy, but um, I could help you at some point if you wish. Then Robert found out that I actually had spent a lot of time in the previous 10 years in the Philippines. And so he had a number of projects there through different companies, and he asked me if I would do some consulting on those, which for me wasn't that difficult given I was going there fairly often anyway. So I said, yeah, okay, you know, we can do that. So I started out doing that and it was maybe 10 or 20% of my time. Uh, it quickly became quite a lot more than that, which I didn't mind because the projects were interesting. And then um, after that, uh, he was looking at Myanmar and doing a, a joint venture with the government. So. He asked me if I would go and take a look at Moniwa. Which had, was, had you been to Myanmar? Before? No, no, I hadn't. This was my first exposure to Myanmar. Mm. So uh, I went across um, to look at Moniwa. It was arranged through the government, etc. Uh, quite, quite amusing, actually. They provided me with four armed guards as I was walking around in the field. I was more worried about them tripping over and shooting me in the back than I was by getting shot by a gorilla. Was, was, and, it, was it necessary? No, it wasn't. Mm. It was just. I think it was protocol. Um, he's a foreigner. We we want to make sure A is safe and B doesn't do anything he's not supposed to. Um, so I spent three weeks um, mapping and sampling at Moniwa, which was very interesting actually. 
So then I wrote a report, came back, and uh, Ed Flood approached me and he said, um, would I be interested in um, joining full time as exploration manager in a new venture? And I said, well, well, possibly, um, but I think that uh, you might be better off relocating your focus to uh, Indonesia because I couldn't really see any obvious potential in Vietnam, Cambodia or Laos at that time given they wanted to make a discovery fairly quickly and list a company. So um, we, I did an orientation trip to Indonesia um, before I made up my mind. I said I'll go down there and I'll have a look and I'll see what opportunities there are there, which I did and it was quite positive actually. Things were moving along well in Indonesia at the time. Uh, specifically what I saw the opportunity was to acquire three million hectares of almost unexplored ground in North East Kalimantan. So I came back to Ed and I said here's what I think and he said well we would really like to have you full time. Uh, I had a lot of respect for Ed, he was a terrific guy, he had a great reputation and he was a pleasure to, to work with. So I said yeah okay I'll, I'll try this and uh, so I, I signed up and then uh, relocated basically to Indonesia working for Indochina Goldfields Private. Um, it didn't list until a couple of years later. Uh, their prime assets became Moniwa, um, the Bakacek deposit. Quick question, what did yes. you think of Moniwa when you went there? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, yeah I thought it was great. And, and I have a, a little more to say about that later. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful deposit and it, it's very, very interesting. Uh, Bakacek I thought was far less interesting for a number of reasons and then uh, the exploration ground in Indonesia. The timing was good. The um, area in northeast Kalimantan was, if, if you wanted to use trendology, it was X kilometres from Briex, which was exploding at the time, although friends of mine had already told me it was a scam at that time. Are you uh, able to say who they were, or would you rather not? Um, no, I don't mind, because um, the person that was always telling me that if this was a scam, was uh, one of my good friends I'd worked with in Fiji called John Levings. So when I went down to uh, assess opportunities for Ivanhoe, uh, sorry for Indochina in Indonesia, one of the first people I contacted was John because he was resident there working for a group of consultants with Murray Rogers. John had worked at Busang for Montague, what they called Busang 1, which did have mineralization, it did have breadship pipes, they drilled it and it was very small. So uh, I discussed this with John about the Montague property and he said, no, it's, it's not what you're looking for. Um, and then when Briex started to unfold, um, John said, there's, there's nothing there. Um, and he stuck to that while the share price went to, I think, $385. He was almost an outcast. But every time I'd meet John, he was just shaking his head and it turned out he was 100% right. So yeah, it was John Levings who um, had a very good idea right from the get-go that it was a... But not, notwithstanding that, he would have said, he would have agreed that picking up the ground you had your eye on in Kalimantan was worthwhile. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we were fortunate because a lot of it, it was, uh, the reason it was underexplored was that it was under moratorium and BRGM had had it forever. Um, they did very little with it other than um, drill a SCAN deposit called Long Lai. But when I looked at the geologic maps, I thought to myself, there's got to be epithermals in there. There has to be. And so um, we did an orientation trip in there, myself and Chris Sennett. Is that using the airborne technique again? No, that, that comes a bit later. Okay. Yeah. So the first trip we did there, Chris and I, um, we were in Kating Tings or these long um, native canoes with a, you know what they are. So we went up rivers and we were camping in small places and we came to an area called the July River. And Chris and I were going up the river with the local and the water was becoming shallower and shallower so we had to get out and, and push as we came to various waterfalls and we started to be able to see the float. And here's all this beautiful coliform banded epithermal float. So we collected a number of these pieces, um, went back to Jakarta, put it into the assay office. Quick question, did you have any issues getting the rocks out? Not at all. So no, no, we just carried them. But, I mean, you had to actually physically move them from one island to another. Oh, no, no, that was never an issue. Never an issue. Okay. No, 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 not at all. So, anyway, um, 
Yeah, we put these into the lab a couple of days later, 12 grams, 8 grams. Good lab at that time? Yes, yes. Yeah, it was... Who ran uh, that? Hmm, Inchcape, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't remember clearly. But yeah, it, it, of course, there was a lot of activity in Indonesia then. And so that was really the discovery uh, moment for the July River epithermals. They're, they're not yet mined, so I believe one or two of them will make it with more work. But uh, it was an incredibly prospective piece of ground. So, so that was pretty exciting, I It know. was very exciting. Yeah. And then later, um, I, uh, Indochina, I organised maybe 25, 30 geologists who were willing to go bush, and we started prospecting this 3 million hectares, and we turned up all kinds of things, uh, many discoveries of different types. One or two probably would have made it, except they were in forestry uh, reserves. A couple more were in areas where there were social problems, uh, the usual story. Anyway, um, so just before Briex, about a month before uh, Ivanhoe, sorry, Indochina, went public in Canada, um, they raised $350 million Canadian, which was the largest float then in Canadian mining history. Um, a great treasury to have. About two months later, Briex hit. So right around PDAC time, if I recall. Yeah, well, once again, um, timing's everything because if they tried to float after Briex, they wouldn't have raised 35 million. So Ivanhoe, um, and Indochina then became Ivanhoe Mines. That's the story. So after the uh, listing of Ivanhoe Mines and the Briex debacle, it was fairly clear that um, there was no money for exploration and specifically Indonesia. So we, we had a reasonably good treasury, so um, we chose to uh, move out of Indonesia and we went to Thailand to explore for sediment hosted gold deposits and epithermals. We also went to South Korea looking for epithermal deposits and we also had selected Mongolia to look for porphyries and epithermals.